But you, you really should read this book, The Strange Death of Europe, Immigration, Identity, and Islam by Douglas Murray. Uh, it is a brave book. It's a smart book. It's a restrained book, and it's an intelligent book. One of the things that is so touching about this interview is that the first part of the book is very factual and tells you what happened and how this immigration policy has basically put Europe on the ropes. I'm not sure it's going to survive at all. The second half is about what's wrong with Europe and the void at the center of Europe, the spiritual void in the center of Europe. And he said he expected to be attacked over that, and nobody even noticed it. I noticed it. I thought it was a great part of the book. Douglas Murray, is uh, the, he founded the former London-based think tank Center for Social Cohesion, and he's an associate uh, director for the Henry Jackson Society and associate editor for The Spectator, an excellent conservative magazine in England. Here is a uh, really interesting interview with Douglas Murray. Uh, Douglas, thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. Great to be with you. Uh, you know, I just, uh, I love this book. I thought it was uh, uh, just a tremendously brave, intelligent, well-researched and well-reasoned piece. And I, I, I'm i wondering, what what has the reaction been? I know in England, uh, people can really take a lot of hits for expressing opinions like this. Have you, has it been a difficult thing to publish a book like this? Well, in a way, much less than I thought. Uh, I was expecting uh, uh, what in the, uh, a friend described as more witch burning than there has <laughs> been. Um, th there's uh, The book immediately became a bestseller in the UK. It went to number one on the bestseller uh, charts in Britain. And uh, um, most of the reaction was, was uh, muted praise. There was a little bit of attempt to shut it down, and unsurprisingly, early on from some of the political left in the UK by decrying it with the usual uh, accusations that are that are used but but I, I tell you what the one thing that is striking to me is on the on the, the the element of the book that is about what has happened immigration what it has been in Europe and Britain in recent decades um, there has been uh, um, some objection to me mentioning it as usual but it's been picked up it's been discussed. The bit that has struck me is that absolutely nobody, I think, has picked up on what I regard as being in some ways the even more important part of the book, which is the us bit. The bit I describe as the vacuum into which people are walking. You know, and the silence on that I find I find extraordinary. It was my favorite part of the book and I want to get to it, but I want to make sure that people understand what we're talking about when we get to it, as you did in the, in the book, in fact. Let, let's start about, you know, the strange death. It's called The Strange Death of Europe, and the subtitle is Immigration, Identity, and Islam. So let's talk about immigration. What, what vision are you putting forward? What have you seen happen uh, through immigration since, basically, since World War II? So I start in the post-World War II period, when Europe started to invite in the guest workers to help rebuild after the war. But... What I see is a speeding up of that process, a sort of losing control of that process by consecutive governments in each Western European country. And then the book really focuses on what then happened in 2015, when Angela Merkel famously opened the doors of Europe to the world and added 2% of the German population in a single year alone almost 3% to the Swedish population in a single year alone. And I say that's, that's just a speeding up of a process that had long been underway. And it's a, it's a losing control of the borders and it, an unwillingness to really enforce the difference between legality and illegality, um, uh, to decide that the law really didn't matter all that much or it was more comfortable not to enforce the law. So that by the time that we're right up to date, you have this situation which I describe as a sort of moroseness that we've got into, where we sort of don't know who's in our countries. Uh, when terrible things happen as a result of that, we skirt over them very fast because we don't know what to do. And this, I think, is, is a uh, catastrophic situation to be in and indeed a deathly, deadly situation to be in. All through this process, you describe the fact that the people didn't want it. The people repeatedly, yes. through every poll, they kept saying, no, please stop. And sometimes the politicians would make speeches as if they were going to stop. Yeah. Why didn't they? Well, it, it became more comfortable for them not to do so. That's, that, that's my overriding uh, impression. Uh, by the time the Blair government came in in the late 1990s in the UK, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the immigration minister at the time, 
that makes this clear. She says, she says removals are, are very um, uh, uh, difficult, both for the person undergoing them and for those uh, enforcing them. And so it's just easier not to do removals. That's removals of people who have broken into the country, oughtn't to be there, have failed every round of the, uh, uh, the appeals process. Um, you know, but even those people. Uh, and now, you see, when you get, come straight up to date uh, by uh, the 2015 crisis in Germany, I give an example of something I was told about whilst I was there on one occasion researching for the book, when for once in, I think, 2016 into 2017, for once even the German authorities decided that they had a group of people from Pakistan who had absolutely no right to come into Germany or Europe in 2015, who said that they wanted asylum. They obviously weren't asylum seekers. They just wanted to have uh, the economic benefits of Europe. And uh, and Germany put them on a plane uh, to send them back to Pakistan, a very, very rare event, this. And the plane came straight back because the Pakistani officials simply said they wouldn't uh, accept the people. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, that's Some of this stuff we're seeing here now in America, we're debating here now in America, we keep hearing, especially conservatives, keep hearing these horror stories about what's going on in Sweden, Germany, the women being raped. Women. You mentioned one story, a couple of stories in the book that I just found mind bending, uh, where yeah. women would be raped but wouldn't report it. They would be afraid of yes. seeming bigoted or or making it yes. hard for the immigrants. Is 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 this? Are these horror stories true? Is this actually going on? Is this? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, everything I write in this book, I'm very conscious that there's a tendency to over-egg some of the things that have been going on in Europe in recent years. And and there's also a tendency to shut down the argument. So what I've done in this book is um, through first-hand reporting and from, you know, a lot of footnoted referenced uh, events, names of people, names of locations, it, you know, I've made it sort of critic-proof. Um uh, uh, to say what's actually going on and then to say, look, this is what it is. Uh, are you happy with this? You know, I'm not saying here's how you completely change it or here's how you turn it around and say, here is a situation we in, in Europe have found ourselves in. And uh, and as I say, I think that the, the, the striking thing is that you don't need to over-egg any of this. What is going on on the ground that you can see is extraordinary. Um, camps of hundreds of people living on the streets uh, outside the centre of Paris, in the suburbs of Paris, living uh, along the, the, the sidewalks in tents. Um, now, you know, it, it's not that Paris has fallen or anything like that. If you go into the centre of Paris, it's as beautiful and charming as it ever was. Mm. It's just that if you go slightly outside, this is what you find. It's the same in Sweden and all the other places I've travelled across the continent. Life you know, to a great extent, goes on as normal, unless you're unlucky enough to be a member of the public and not in the highest net worth bracket, uh, in which case you've got to accept that the society you're born into is in the process of fundamentally changing, whether you like it or not. You don't have a say. And, and so much of this, I mean, as I said, the, the, the subtitle of the book is called The Strange Death of Europe, Immigration, Identity and Islam. So much of this has to do with Islam and yes. the the terror of seeming bigoted by uh, criticizing Islam as if it, as if Islam were a race, as if it were in a set of ideas, yes. and somehow it's wrong to criticize a set of ideas. I, I, we hear stories here of English people actually being arrested for saying disparaging things about Islam. I should ask first if that if those stories are true, can you actually get arrested or penalized in some you, way? You can you can certainly be called in for questioning. Arrested by the, well, invited him for questioning by the police if you were to, for instance, say certain things about uh, the religion or to be seen to be um, um, saying things that are derogatory about a group. I mentioned the Islam thing in the subtitle of this book for a very specific reason. Uh, we've had seen all sorts of Im immigration into Europe. What's striking to me about the Islam bit is that it's, it's, it's just obviously at this stage the bit of the immigration that Europe is finding it hardest to digest. And which, you know, maybe it will not be able to digest it. Maybe it won't be able to accommodate it without uh, having to undergo very significant changes, which I think we are undergoing, uh, or, you know, with increasingly um, very disturbing events going on. I, but, but the Islam bit is, is a serious values challenge. Uh, uh, we are in this very strange dialogue at the moment as a society with certainly portions of the Muslim communities in Europe. 
where we in Europe say, we would like you, after all of these decades, we would like you to become like us. And a certain portion of this community says, we don't want to become like you. Look at you. We don't want that. And we say back, are you sure? <laughs> We'd love it if you joined us. It'd be ever so nice. And they say, no. And then eventually we get to the crucial one, is that they effectively say, what are you going to do about it? And we say, nothing. Hmm. That's uh, the current status of the dialogue. Right, right. And it's, it's very frightening because the, the stupidity of the debate, at least here, is, is so uh, intense that it, it does seem, it just seems a worthwhile question. Is it possible to have a set of ideas that's antithetical to Western thought? And of course it is. Yes, you, you, I can assure you, you're, reassure you that your American debate is positively <laughs> Socratic compared, <laughs> I guess compared, I'm, I, uh, compared I, to the discussion uh, and dialogue in Europe. I I, I mean, I, at least you have a discussion and dialogue on these matters. At least you have outriders, prominent figures who are putting their heads above the parapet. And it is a very, very small number of people remotely willing to do that in Europe at the moment. Yeah. I, you know, let's let us talk about this idea of the void in Europe. You mentioned the book uh, Submission, which uh, I read last year. Really, one of the best, um, certainly Willebeck's best novel, and one of the best modern novels I've read in several years. And basically, the thesis of this book, without giving it away, but the thesis of the book is there's nothing to regret if we leave behind the West. The West is broken yes. uh, and empty. You you call it a sense that things are over, a sense that the story is over. Yes. Uh, describe that a little bit so people know what we're talking about. This is the, this is a really striking thing to me is that uh, uh, all of these things are things that have happened to us, all the immigration and so on. But what we're what we're what we're reduced to now is what one French philosopher recently described as. We had this idea that our values would go around the world, and for a time we tried some of that. Uh, then that retreated, and now we're in this morose period of, I wonder if we can hold on to them for ourselves. Mm. Now, um, my view is there is underneath all of this going on in Europe, this sense of, uh, of ennui or what I call tiredness. That we sort of tried everything. We're unpersuaded that we should continue to take our own position in any argument. And we've decided basically to be a sort of united nations of the world, a place where basically anyone can move in and call it home. And you see, I think this sense of tiredness, the void, is exacerbated by the movement of people into Europe because you lose your sense of what it is that makes you you or what makes your society your society, other than that it's a sort of rather nice sort of migrant camp, a grand migrant camp. And and so all those things we used to talk about, oh, you know, the, the British sensibility or the, you know, the French uh, manner and so on, all these things become, even those sort of glib bits become basically um, passe. They don't really sum up what we've become or what we're in the process of becoming. And, you know, I think that even we have this endless debate in Britain now, about what are British values? And they're, they're basically reconfigured all the time. Um, and, you know, children in schools are meant to be taught British values. And this, this, there's something really, in my mind, pitiful about this, because even, even as I was growing up, I knew, I'm only in my late 30s, uh, I knew what British values were. I still do, I think. I certainly got a sense of what being British is. Um, and an immovable sense of that. Uh, but 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 we've had to change that because if you invite in the world, you've basically got to change your self-definition. And so we have this thing now where instead of it being an identifiable thing you can touch, you can feel, being British is, is a sort of set of rather packed things about, you know, being British is about being inclusive. It, 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 it's never about anything that could keep anyone out. Mm. It's only about things that could keep the widest possible range of people in. And, you know, this is what we're reduced to and, and because we're trying to include the world. The whole point of a definition is that it excludes other things. I mean, that is almost the definition yes. of a definition. You talk about but, <laughs> you, you talk about uh, in the in the novel submission. Uh, there is the scene where the uh, protagonist tries to go back and recapture uh, some of the feeling of Christianity. Mm -hmm. You write in The Strange Death of Europe of how the decay of Christianity, the post living in a post-Christian world, has, has basically pulled out the last, the bottom block of the tower so that you have nothing to base your identity on. 
Yes, this is this is a very painful bit in the book for me to write and, and for a lot of readers. I'm just trying to say where I think we are. A lot of people aren't willing to do that. Uh, I, I'm not a li I'm not a believer myself, so I say this not from a point to try to prove my own rightness, but just to diagnose, to define. And my own view is that yes, there's this. We are in this extraordinary void at the moment because we no longer want to sustain the things that got us here. And indeed, we're doing something which I think is very common across the West and I think in America in particular at the moment, which is to sort of assume that, that where you and I are at the moment is the natural default position of mankind. That basically, if you went through any period in history, we could be we could be in the, um, you know, three, 5,000 years ago, we could be 400 years ago, it could be 70 years ago. And basically, uh, uh, it would all sort of default to where we are now. We'd be having a conversation on Skype about the same ideas. None of this, none of this takes into account the far more obvious thing is that what you and I enjoy, what, what uh, the people we know enjoy, is an unbelievable blip at the end point of a process none of which was inevitable, none of which was always going to get us here. And so the ideas matter. That's why, by the way, sorry, just quickly to go back to the Islam thing, that's why nobody wants to talk about what Islam's ideas and values are, because we just kind of hope that it doesn't matter <laughs> and that ideas don't matter. And we'd have always got here, you know. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the same thing with this desire to sort of basically rewrite our past. We're always going to be here. We're always going to enjoy these human rights. And now all we've got to do is nix a little bit of the transgender bit still, fix a little bit of other bits of rights, make women and men exactly the same, and a couple of other really simple processes, <laughs> and then we're sort of in nirvana. <laughs> and, and I think this is all predicated on lies. It's all lies. Terrible, terrible misreadings, <laughs> ignorance, lies. But at least let's be honest, whatever we think, at least let's diagnose where we are honestly. And, and as I say, I find almost, well, very few, I mean, ones of people willing to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I am uh, a Jew who became a Christian at the age of 50. And uh, I, I keep reading, yours is, is maybe the fifth or sixth book, including Submission, actually, that, that puts forward the idea only with Christianity can our civilization stand, but I cannot believe, as an intellectual man of the moment, right. I simply cannot believe. And I think that that is where the crisis lies. I really do think uh, we need a, a new but, Oxford movement that brings uh, intellectual weight to the to Well, the that's pay. possible. I mean, it's, it's one of the directions it could go in. And there's a number of directions, I think. One of them is that thing of, yes, returning to a source. Now, some people, by the way, are returning to the source and see it as the Enlightenment. I'm not entirely opposed to that by any means. Mm -hmm. I think that it has its own sort of creation myth and so on. Yes. But there are various ways you can go back to this. What I, what I just urge people to do in this book is to return seriously to this debate, to recognize the reality of where we are, to recognize the truth of how we got here and to at least involve themselves in that serious and profound discussion, whether they're believers or non-believers. I do say at one point in the book that, that if we could mend what has been the believer versus non-believer rift of recent years and recognize that, I quote a former uh, a bishop of Edinburgh, we're, we're basically Christians whether we like it or right, not. Right, of course. Yeah. Um, if we sort of uh, uh, recognize some of that, you can get towards healing this rift. What I do know, though, is that with all of the challenges we now face in our societies, I just cannot see any way round or through them that doesn't involve an addressing of this fundamental schism. Yes. Now, you mentioned the Marcelo Perro book, which is one of the books I read, and I, I think you're absolutely right. Mm. I wish I could talk to you. I would talk to you for another hour. I really could, but uh, I'm out of time. We'll do that one day. Uh, yes, but please, if you're in L.A., please uh, do look me up. And uh, I just think it's a terrific book, The Strange Death of Europe, Immigration, Identity, Islam by Douglas Murray. Douglas, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. It's been a great pleasure. All right. I think you will remember that that book actually made stuff I like, which is incredibly rare for a piece of uh, nonfiction.